Hi, my name is Peter Midgley, and I'm the author of Let Us Not Think of Them as Barbarians, published by New West Press. My collection is a polyphonic evocation of the Namibian genocide, the first genocide of the 20th century, when between 1904 and 1908, German troops decimated the Nama and the Herero. In the collection, Dragfoot, crippled by his implication in the legacy of colonialism, accompanies his lover, the very consciously unnamed woman, as they travel through time and space among the bones that lie scattered in the desert. I will read three poems from the collection. Words melt in his mouth. Words melt in his throat, emerge dark as honey. The night's clamminess ushers in the rattletrap dance of skeletons against the horizon. They are legion, like the sands of the sea and the skulls in the sand. The sailors, the explorers, the wanderers, the prisoners of this land. They are legion, they are silent. They have died in multiple ways, each death, a parting, and a return. Who knows from whence they came? What is departure? What is return? Taste the earth. No, no, no. Taste the earth. Go down on your hands and knees, dig down below the brown hide to where the desert sand throbs a darkened red. Fill your fingernails with this soil. Let it sink again, black as honey, this ink of my body, into the de blotted desert. Taste the earth. Smell it. Feel it. Feel its textures and its joys weeping to the surface like water. The sorrow. The heartache. The bones of the ancestors drying in poisoned wells. Taste this earth and feel its pain. Taste the earth blotted with the ink of many bodies. Between 1904 and 1908, at the concentration camp on Shark Island, the death toll among the predominantly Nama prisoners was above 90%. The women in the camp were made to boil the skulls of the deceased and crate them so they could be shipped off to the curio shops and to the museums and research centers in Europe. Shark Island. See, said the commandant, and you, 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 Und sie, 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 sie. Vierzig Mal. Und dann noch fünf. Und dann nichts mehr. Forty-five skulls is all they needed in the curio shops of Europe. After all, they were not barbarians. The final poem is one called The Horses of Hunger. Um, after the Battle of Ohamakari in 19, 11 August 1904, the German troops chased the defeated Herero into the Kalahari Desert, poisoning the wells behind them. So the Herero either died of thirst or starvation, and those that did survive and turn back were either shot on sight or were rounded up and transported by train to the concentration camps on the coast at Walfish Bay or at Lidoritz, where Shark Island was located. The other name in this poem that you will encounter is Mandume, and that is Mandume Kain Demofayo, the last king of the Kwanyama, who in 1917 took his own life in battle rather than to submit to colonial rule. The Horses of Hunger We ride the horses of hunger, the horses of hunger, we ride them. 
The horses of hunger, we ride them on stomachs of air. Smoke curls from the nostrils of dragons. Flared in anger, their breath smoulders. Ah, these horses, these horses, these horses of hunger, their breath smoulders in empty stomachs, fulminates as it leaves the body. Put a gun in my mouth. Put a gun in my mouth so I can take aim. Put a gun in my mouth. Put the gun which I fought alongside Mandume. Put it, put it, put the gun in my mouth. Put Mandume's gun in my mouth. I want to fire with words when bullets forsake me. Uh, thank you all for listening tonight, and thank you also, especially to Turnstone Press, for inviting me to read as part of this series, and for partner, partnering me with Sally Ito. Um, may the next 40 years be as rewarding as the ones we're celebrating this evening. And finally, please support your local bookstores, independent bookstores and small presses, authors, publishers, booksellers, they all need to buy you to buy their books now more than ever. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sally Ito, and I'll be reading two poems uh, from Alert to Glory, published by Turnstone Press in 2016. I'm here at St. Margaret's Anglican Church, and we'll be reading two poems about Easter. Uh, the first one is At the Beginning of Lent, Ash Wednesday. My mind is a brick, and nothing gets through. The porous sponge of my youth is desiccated into a slab of stone. Painting the ashes on such a surface is an idle act, or a leap of faith by the bestower. For the mind, while receiving this mortal dust of sacrifice, is wandering through the temple maze of cellars, wondering what to buy, eat, in the morrow. Well, There'll be no sugar, caffeine, or even meat. The beans will need soaking, and the fish bought fresh. The sermon is about a recalcitrant camel made to suckle its mutant offspring, an oversized albino calf whose onerous mirth, birth caused the mother's heart to harden, become indifferent. My mind is that heart. The shepherds hire musicians sing and rub the poor mother's neck, and finally teardrops glisten in that old Naga's eyes, and she is made to look on her child as if it were her own for the very first time. The brick, now sodden with tears, will keep in the moisture longer than you think, and when through the doors of the church I slip into the world, the ash will be in me like salt in the sea. The second poem is called An Easter Devotional, Winnipeg, Canada. Spring here attends you with rude violence, snow-melted blight exposing brittle arrows of trees, barbed shrubs, sodden ground littered with last year's toy or shoe a testament to the wasteland of the heart before the warm blast of breath that bursts open the pod and clenches the fisted bud. The river rumbles, ice breaking into jagged slabs, thundering and carving its way through, now flooding the plain, now grinding down the beds of stone beneath its weighted flowing. Bread, left out for the birds, sopping with spring sleet, becomes a sponge for the wine of your thirst. Or in the same day, in the dry heat of a sudden sun, a crust so hard, it is the stone that cries out your name. How spring here lays bare its naked terrain in remembrance of your dying flesh, its veins soon to rupture too with the blood of new life to seep in at the edges. The mourners, still in their winter overcoats, boots laden with the mud cake debris of last year's leaves, tramp past your cross, hushed with lowered eyes, to a ground tarred and dark with death. They will await the coming season, like the old woman at the kitchen window, 
straining to see the sky stitched with the jagged V of returning geese, harbingers of the season, like the unraveled linen trailing the path in front of the opened tomb. <laughs>